I am a philologist, a classical philologist. I have studied and researched Greek classics for a long time. I have written books especially about Greek tragedy and particularly about Aeschylus and his work. Due to strong circumstances and unexpected vicissitudes of academic Italian life, I don't work as a philologist. I don't teach Greek literature. But although I am always with obstinacy persevering in studying the Greek tragedy and Aeschylus, I was forced to teach classics. Classics in the history of art and the history of architecture, classics and the classical tradition at the University UAV of Venice. Since 2001, I have been the director of a web journal of humanities, Engramma, the classical tradition in Western memory. The focus of my research about classical tradition was the definition of what classical tradition is. In fact, I think classical tradition is quite different from all other cultural traditions and this difference is important and significant from its origins in the course of its long millennial history. The classical tradition is not the corpus of established texts, not an archive of fixed figures and unchanging archetypes, but a repository of archetypal models subject to many historical transformations. From its first beginnings, the classical tradition is not the mere inheritance of a cultural legacy, but it is a movement which involves at every age change, ancient models, figures, words, symbols, and each time transforms them into new forms, new expressions, new works of art. The development of classical tradition resembles the DNA helicoidal model. At any circle, at any turnover, at any twist, it involves all the elements but shows itself in a new way. The methodology I have chosen for the studies of my own school derives from the work and the thinking of Abi Warburg, who was not a philologist. And when I began my lessons about classical tradition in the 90s, was not in fashion, not so up to date as now in humanities studies. I guess some of you know the Warburg Institute in London, but never linked it with the name of the German scholar Abi Warburg. Abi Warburg was an art historian, or better, an historian of culture, who died in 1999. It was Warburg that took the word engram, engram, the title of the review I direct, from the field of biological and neurological sciences and transferred this new word, engram, to the field of humanities and classical studies. At the beginning of the 20th century, a German, a German biologist and neurologist, Richard Semon, hypothesized the inheritance of acquired characters into memory and called it mneme. His idea of the mneme was named and based on the Greek goddess mneme, the mother of the muses, one of the muses, the muse of memory. Mneme represented the memory of an external to internal experience. The resulting mnemic trace or engram would be revived when an element resembling a component of the original complex of stimuli was encountered. Zemnon mnemic principled was based upon how stimuli produce a permanent record written or engraved on the irritable substance, that is, upon cellular material predisposed to such inscription. The engram is the effect, effect which remains in the stimulated substance of the brain after the excitement produced by the stimulation has apparently ceased. These imprints could be revived where the irritable substance of the brain, and in cultural studies also the social mind, was stimulated by external experience or by internal emotions. 
Richard Simons posits the concept of engram, of engram, engram in a strict biological sense, whilst Abi Warburg extended it to cultural studies. The flexibility and the worth of Warburgian research accords with many different contemporary methods of research. Cultural transmission occurs by the selective reproduction of single memes, thoughts, ideas, figures, words, commonplace, habits, or groups of, meme, of memes, languages, religions, styles. Battling, fighting each other to reproduce and to survive. According to Abi Warburg, inheritance of cultural products transmitted by social memory in Western civilization becomes effective only through contact with the selective will of a per particular historical period. Polarization of engrams, which occurs uh, through an uh, encounter with uh, a new epoch and its vital needs, can then bring about a transformation in meaning. And these new forms of expressions, these new meanings, uh, re-emerge also without the visible link which directly connects each other. The engram can disappear and then appear again after a long, a long latency, like an underground river which at any, time, at any time springs out of ground. We need to remember that this idea of engram was conceived about 50 years before the discovery of the double helix of DNA by Crick and Watson in 1953, but not before Darwin's research about the behaviors and the expression of emotions in animals and men. And I would like to underline at this point that among the thousands of books he had in his library, Abi Warburg said that the most useful for his cultural researches was the expression of emotions by Darwin. Abi Warburg connected the persistency of engrams in social memory with the continuity and the strength of the expression of human pathos and read this relationship in Western art from antiquity to his days, anticipating the idea of the DNA in the sense of a cultural DNA. One of the most important legacies and the complexity of his short languages shows in how far he overcharges the objects. Archaeological pieces, works of Renaissance art, paintings, illuminations, but also contemporary objects like new newspaper cuttings, pictures from reviews, and finally stamps. In this monumental work, the Atlas Mnemosine, the Atlas of Memory, Abi Warburg succeeded in proving that the development of classical tradition in, and its metamorphosis from its distant beginnings in antiquity to the present time. So, about 10 years ago, with a group of very young scholars, scholars of classical tradition of classics, we created the, the web journal in Gramma. From 2001 to 2010, at this day, Engram has produced more than 80 issues, all online, all free. For many centuries and up to the present time, classics are studied from different points of view, from, from the perspectives of the history of literature, of the philology, of the archaeological sciences, of the history of ancient arts, of anthropology and cultural studies. I think the methodology which Abi Warburg outlines in his works, and especially in the Atlas Mnemosine, the Atlas of Memory, could be the most useful tool for the researcher of the themes of classical tradition. This great utility depends on the characteristics of both the subjects of classical tradition and the Warburgian methodology itself. Indeed, the Abbey Warburg's methodology is characterized by elasticity and flexibility, 
and the particular awareness of internal historical dynamics which are very close to the nature, to the aim, to the evolutions of classical traditions. And Gramma research work focuses on the classical tradition in Western culture. According with the Warburgian studies, Engramma considers persistence, renewal and the new interpretations of forms, themes, myths, subjects from antiquity into medieval and, into medieval and then into Renaissance and modern times. Zum Bild das Wort. Let's give word to image. This motto coined by Abi Warburg for, for his scholarly undertaking, reminds us of the necessity to give word to image. In our work in Engramma too, images are not a mere explanatory set, but a primary study subject and a vehicle of research. Warburg style research aims to restore an alchemical marriage between word and image, and thus finds in in web publishing, as in our web journal, its most suitable way of expression. The hypertest gives shape to the complex mechanism of transmission and connection of stimuli to the human brain and so to the social memory. In this respect, it is very similar, similar to Warburg's methods of associating images, words and thought. Engramma considers the dynamics of Western cultural DNA, the persistence of the strength of icons from antiquity is studied in the review of Gramma in different cultural fields, not only in art history, but in new media as well, like the afterlife of classical images and themes in contemporary advertising, or the continuity of myths and stories from antiquity to the present, to the art of the tenth muse, the movies. The, the review and drama considers the dynamics of Western cultural DNA, the persistence of the strength of icons from antiquity is studied in different cultural fields, not only in art history, but in new media as well, like the afterlife of classical images and themes in contemporary advertising, or the continuity of myths and stories from antiquity to the art of the tenth muse in movies. And Grandma was born in 2001, without money, but only on the wings of, the, of enthusiasm, which means the Latin studium, passion for the research and love for the knowledge. Of young scholars of classical and and history of art who want to provoke a new, a new renaissance of classical studies. And Gramma was born by the eros of knowledge and by a strong faith in the power of the imprints of the ancient form of beauty, a real confidence in the Greek way of seeing and of describing the world. Well, I would like to finish this speech with a story, the story of the birth of Eros that Diotima tells us in Plato's Symposium. On the birth of Aphrodite, there was a feast of the gods, at which the god Poros, who is the son of Metis, Poros means way in Greek, as a resource. Metis is a name of the ductile intelligence, was one of the guests. When the feast was over, Penia, Penia means poverty in Greek, lack, as the man it is on such occasions, come to the door to beg. Now, Poros resource, who had drunk so much nectar, there was no wine that age, went into the garden of Zeus and fell into a deep sleep, and Penia, poverty, plotted to have a child by him. She lay down at his side and conceived Eros, who partly because he is naturally a lover of the beautiful and because Aphrodite is herself beautiful and also because he was born on her birthday, is the follower and attendant of Aphrodite. As his parentage is, 
so also are his fortunes. Indeed, Eros is always poor, and anything but tender and fair as most imagine him. Really, he is rough and squalid, and has no shoes, no house to dwell in. On the bare earth exposed, he lies under the open heavens, in the streets, or at the doors of the houses, taking his rest. And like his mo mother, the poverty, is he, he is always in distress. Like his father too, the porous resource, whom he also partly resembles, he is always plotting against the fair and good. Eros is bold, enterprising, strong, is a mighty hunter, always weaving some intrigue or other. Eros is keen in the pursuit of wisdom, fertile in resources. Eros is a lover of wisdom at all times. Eros is terrible as an enchanter. Eros is a sorcerer, is a sophist. In Gramma, like the, li the classical tradition we study and love, is like the mythical Eros. It is poor, it has no shoes, nor a house to dwell in, but we hope it is beautiful and the lover of beauty. And Gramma is bold in research, keen in chasing knowledge. And Gramma is a son of Metis, the ductil intelligence, but it is also a child of Poros, who always find the escape route. And this mother, mother is Penia, the poverty in which lies, not only in Italy, but everywhere in the world, the study of humanities.